Yes, hello everyone. I am Dr. Gohan Mamun and we are lucky to have today with us Dr. Zafar Iqbal, who is a celebrity doctor, really. And he's a sports scientist working in the Premier League and working with football and cricket uh, at the moment, football primarily. So we're going to have an interview for footballpakistan.com and we're so thankful to him for agreeing to do this despite his really, despite really, his really busy schedule. So welcome Dr. Zafar. Thank you for doing this. No problem at all. Zakla for, uh, uh, for inviting me. Let me just correct you there. First of all, I'm a uh, sports medicine consultant, not a, not a sports scientist. Um, and then the, Certainly not a celebrity doctor. Uh, I think if you saw me every time that I go back home and see my parents and my dad uh, has me replacing the toilet seat or cleaning the gutters, I, I certainly don't think that you'd be thinking I'm a uh, celebrity doctor. Yeah, humble. Celebrity for us. So uh, just a brief introduction for those people who do not know. So head of sports medicine at Crystal Palace Football Club, consultant in sports and exercise medicine working in football since 2005 and in the Premier League since 2007. Previously worked uh, with Liverpool and Tottenham as well. Now consultant to Shawa Zalmi and the Trent Cricket Club. And a very active and uh, supporter of the British Asian community and uh, good things in general. So let's start uh, the interview. My first question was going to be, how does it feel to be a celebrity doctor? So if you've got an answer, uh, for that. So what made you pursue sports medicine as a career? It's not a traditional field. Like uh, when we get out of our MD, MBBS, we're thinking of becoming consultants in various things. Sport medicine traditionally hasn't been top up there. So how, how did this come about? Sure. Well, I, I actually uh, wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Uh, and uh, I always wanted to be a doctor to start off with from the age of 10 because unfortunately I had a sister who had brain cancer from the age of three. And uh, over the next uh, seven years or so, six years, unfortunately I saw the care that she received in the hospital. And, um, and, and it's something I don't forget because unfortunately she, she passed away on my 16th birthday. But I, I was really determined to be a doctor. And initially I wanted to be a neurosurgeon because of my experiences with her and what, what she'd gone through. Then pediatrics, uh, but then I felt that it was going to be a little bit too close to home and I'd, I'd be too emotionally involved with regards to patients. And then I thought orthopedic surgeon because uh, from a young age, my dad's always got me fixing things around the house. And uh, so I like my carpentry and, and DIY. So I thought, why not combine the two? And, and, and with orthopedics, you see quick results. So I wanted to go down that uh, uh, pathway, but then... In the early 2000s, um, I got a knee injury, so I, I love my sports, mainly football. So I was playing five-a-side, I injured my right knee, had an ACL injury. And at that time, even though I was a doctor, I was told that it was going to be 18 months for an MRI scan, and uh, which is quite disappointing. And I was like, well, if I've got diabetes or heart disease, I can get treatment straight away. Whereas, as you rightly pointed out, sports medicine, it's, it's not uh, taught well in medical school. And I just, I, I just found it quite demoralizing. So here I am gaining weight, uh, not able to do what I loved. Obviously, I was still a doctor, but I wasn't able to play sports, started gaining weight. So I then decided to uh, study some further in sports medicine. So I did an MSc in sports medicine in 2004 and then started setting up and developing sports medicine clinics to really help pe people like myself. Um, and then one thing rolled into another. I, I tried to educate myself as much as possible, became the chairman of the FA Medical Society, organizing sports medicine conferences for other doctors and physios. And, and that's really where my career started. Wonderful. So now we've come to the point that we are the head of sports science and medicine department in Crystal Palace Football Club. So what is your role today and what services do you provide for the football club? So, okay, so my, my overall responsibility is, is for the health and welfare of all the players. Um, and, and to put it in a nutshell, basically, I've got to try and provide as many players as possible in the best shape as possible to the manager. Okay, so my role is really to find the best practices around the world so that I can provide the best uh, best care for the players, and I'm I'm 
I've been in quite a fortunate position in, in the clubs that I've worked with. So I've worked with some of the best specialists from around the world, uh, the best doctors are in, in, around in the world. So I've learned a lot from them. But when I came to Crystal Palace, which, you know, certainly around the world, it may not be seen as big a club as uh, Tottenham Hotspur and, and, and Liverpool. But I was told clearly that, look, we just want to try and provide the best care possible and the best practice possible. So that's what I've been given uh, the license to be able to do. And so in my roles, I'm also chairman, as I mentioned, of the FA Medical Society. I'm a lecturer. I organize regular conferences. So I'm, I'm speaking with other sports, uh, other clubs on a regular basis. And I'm, I'm continually trying to update in terms of what our practice is. And ultimately, it's, it's about finding whatever the best practice is. for. So whether it be a particular type of injury, uh, how to make a player fitter, faster, stronger, recovery strategies, it's really about trying to find what the best evidence out there is and trying to provide that for our players. Um, so I, I've, over the years, we've created an operation manual which has all of our practices within there. Um, and the aim is, is to constantly develop ourselves on that, on that manual so that, you know, and, and without being arrogant or rude, that we could then put ourselves and compare with other clubs who've got far more... Uh, finances uh, and bigger clubs to say that actually in terms of the way that we look after our players is as good as uh, anywhere else in the world. So uh, just from this question, how much a difference does, does it make to have a department that is right up there with the best for an athlete and for the peak performance that they can put in uh, into any uh, match or any game? Look, let's not kid ourselves. It, 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 it's important to have a good medical team because you, it's inevitable that players are going to get injured. Okay, So what the purpose of the medical team is to try and use whatever best practice is out there uh, to try and get that player back onto the football pitch or whichever uh, sport that they're in as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, Ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to be working with the best players available as well. So there's no doubt, like when I was at Liverpool, we had some of the best players in the world. And same at Tottenham, you know, I, I was fortunate to work with the likes of Luka Modric and Gareth Bale there, Berbatov. And at Liverpool, obviously, Gerard Suarez and, and uh, Coutinho. And even at, you know, at, at, at uh, Crystal Palace, we've got excellent players as well. You know, Zaha obviously com comes to mind. And but these guys also, the, the advantage is that, um, you know, the likes of Suarez... Listen, he didn't need a doctor, you know. <laughs> well, certainly not, certainly not one uh, to help him in terms of performing on the pitch because this guy, you would never see him in the treatment room. You know, he, he, never, he never missed a single game due to injury. So recruitment plays a huge part in that. Uh, obviously, the manager plays a huge part in that because um, the manager's training has a big influence in terms of how they're going to perform on the pitch and also uh, whether they're going to pick up injuries as well. So... Um, we're, we're just there to really support uh, the manager and the club and the players. But I think it is important that you do have a good uh, medical team because then when a player does get injured, that you are able to help, hopefully, help them return back to their sport as quickly as possible. So, you talked about Liverpool and you've talked about time at Tottenham. So, what has been the standout moment uh, in your career over the last decade or so, something that, that, that just clicks when, when you remember that time? Wow. Uh, well, apart from, as I say, probably having some of the best, and even now, I, I, I've probably got the best job in the world. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm getting paid to look after footballers and I love sport. But I think the biggest thing was, was being accepted. And what I mean by that is I've never hidden the fact that I'm Pakistani, I'm Muslim. And to go into these environments where I'd like to think that I've been selected because of my work ethic and, 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 and what I've done and, and still being accepted there was, uh, was probably a thing that stands out. And it's, I'll give you two examples. So I remember when we uh, won the League Cup with Liverpool and um, we are just about to go into the changing rooms and, and uh, Pepe Reina and Glenn Johnson stopped me from going in and said, Doc, don't go in there's going to be alcohol flying about. And they'd actually taken the time to take my clothes 
out of the dressing room. And I was there by myself, out of the dressing room, but I had the biggest grin you could imagine because of the fact, I just appreciate the fact that they, even in that moment where they're celebrating, they'd had the foresight to think about me and remove my clothes, which for me was massive, was massive. Another time when um, during Ramzan, we were playing football, this is when I was at Tottenham Hotspur, and uh, we were playing a cup game. And it was away at Newcastle. I remember five minutes before uh, we we're about to start, the manager's giving his team talk. There's a knock on the door and the security guy brings in this huge platter of food and they said, this is for the dog. And he, he interrupts the, the manager's talk and he brings this huge platter of food over to me. And it was time to open iftar. And unbeknown to me, uh, Jonathan Woodgate, who, uh, who I worked with at, at Spurs, knew I was fasting and without even me asking him, had sorted out a plate of food for me uh, because he used to play at Newcastle and sorted out a plate of food for me. And again, it's just little things like that, which just were, were quite humbling, really, and just made me feel uh, appreciated. So apart from the obvious things like in 2013-14, where Liverpool, where I was there, where we almost won the league, apart from the obvious slip that everyone remembers and obviously winning you know, the, the League Cup with Spurs and, and, and Liverpool, it's actually the other the other moments that I really remember and, and, and being accepted uh, without having to hide who I am. I think that really uh, means a lot to me. Absolutely. As observers, we see you leading and uh, paving the way, breaking barriers for the British, Asian, Pakistani and subcontinent community uh, in the UK and Muslim community in general. So... Have you been getting these kids who want to get into medicine or are doing their uh, medicine from the UK or even in Pakistan, India, come up to you and say, hey, we want to become just like Dr. Zafar and we want to be on the dugout. And since you've been doing it, we've seen more and more of uh, Asian people and Muslims in, in the dugouts and in, in these yep. Premier League football clubs uh, uh, in general. So do you get those people who want to yeah, on a, on, a, on, a on, a, on a regular basis. I mean, almost uh, every other day I'll get an email. Uh, certainly at Liverpool, it was, yeah, I'd be getting every day, I'd be getting emails and, and, and requests. Um, and, you know, it always made me laugh when they said, we want your job. And I'd be like, okay, well, if you want my job, what, what am I going to be doing? Uh, but uh, uh, but no, I, I understand. And, and, and from the outside, it, it, it can come across as, as a glamorous job, but if you ask my family, my wife and kids, who've obviously made lots of sacrifices, it's it's a it's an a never-ending task. You know, it's non-stop. I've I've given up a social life. Um, the amount of birthdays and weddings that I've had to miss because obviously every weekend we have games and stuff, and we're constantly traveling. So on one side, it is good because you're working at the elite end of sport, but then there have been lots of sacrifices that have been made. But um, look, it, it is good when people see that and, and, and I suppose they probably see somebody that they can relate to and they think, well, you know, here's an opportunity that I can also get into it. And I, th I think that's probably the, the message that I try and give to them is that, look, if someone like me uh, can have a career in sports medicine and have worked at the places that I have done, there's no reason why they can't either. But ultimately, and this is what I, where probably turns off people, is there's no substitute for hard work. So it's not a, just a case so that you can just turn up and, and, and sit on a bench. It's all those hours that have, that have gone in the background, which people don't see, where I was working voluntarily for years. I was, I was going at lower league clubs, where I was basically having to learn my trade. You know, and the amount of voluntary work that I've had to do over the years is, you know, my wife always used to tell me, well, what are you doing, you know? Uh, surely you should be spending more time at home and doing this. What are you gaining out of this? And listen, uh, I've got a lot to be thankful for her for the sacrifices that she's made as well. But the thing that people don't see is all all the all the work that has gone in, into leading to to this stage now. Alhamdulillah. So um, I'll encourage anyone. Uh, it's for me. It's it's you know as I say, I pinch myself. I've got I've got the best job in the world. Um, and it wouldn't matter which league or level it is, you know, looking after after players or athletes and being able to help them return to back to what they enjoy doing. I think the reward that you get from that personally is, 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 is you know, very satisfying um, and, and great, really. So 
I'd encourage anyone, if they really want to do it, yes, you can do it. But as I said, be prepared that you've got to put a huge amount of uh, work into it and be willing to make lots of sacrifices. All this hard work and all this effort, how does it translate in the end for the club perspective and the players' perspective? Can we get a stat or something like that? How many injuries do you guys end up preventing? And how many games in a year do you end up saving for a, uh, for a player that is super athlete? Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one, that, because at the end of the day, there's no doubt. That also depends in terms of what uh, players you actually have. So, as I said, I, I could name Suarez as just one of those examples where in the three and a half years that I was there, honestly, he never missed a single game due to injury. I'm sure that he was injured. I'm sure he was injured, but he was able to cope. Uh, he certainly missed games due to other misdemeanors, but the less the said about that, the better. But um, uh, And then there'd be other players who would have what you'd see as relatively a little issue and they would be out for a very long period of time. Um, what my role is, is really to make sure that we try and find the best practice out there. I keep going back to that. And we've written uh, quite extensively on, on various injuries, which, again, I'm quite happy about with the team that I've worked with, which have been published. And now other clubs and other sports are using those same ideas and papers that we've actually done. So that's probably the best example that I can give because to try and give you a stat in terms of, oh, well, we've re reduced injuries by 10% or 15% is always going to be difficult because there's so many variables. One in terms of what type of manager you have, if they're willing to listen to you, the types of players that you have, whether you're involved in European competitions or not, because obviously if you're involved in more games, that's going to increase the risk of injuries as well. Uh, so for me, where it really starts from is, is making sure you recruit right, that you've got the, the, the best players possible. Then on top of that, your role is to try and make players as fitter, faster and stronger. Now, I think if you speak to any of the players that I have worked with, they've certainly realised over time that the team that I've been involved with, uh, the rest of my physios, and I've been fortunate to have worked with some excellent physios and sports science staff, is that together, the processes that we put in place have helped them far more than... Uh, than they've had in the past. Uh, and it, with injuries that they've had in the past, they've seen much clearer uh, ideas in terms of returning and also reducing the risk of re-injuries. Because that's the big one for me, is making sure that when a player returns, that they're not just continually breaking down again. And touch wood, I think that's probably the biggest factor that we've had in, in, the, in the places that have been, where if the manager has allowed us to, we've made the players fitter, faster and stronger, but also reduce the risk of them re-injuring with, with the same injury again. Talk about recruiting the best players. Just a short question. You've got to, in, uh, do the managers take your input and the clubs who are, well, uh, recruiting players and spending all those 50 million pounds and 100 million pounds nowadays. So do you got an input in that? Yeah, uh, I, I have to, uh, and I, I insist on it and I try and be as strong as possible. Um, as you rightly pointed out, you know, th these players, they can earn anything from 70,000 to, you know, a couple hundred thousand pounds a week. Uh, and then actually buying the player as well. And it, and it does make me laugh when sometimes you hear of, of players having been bought without even having a proper medical or, <laughs> or the, you know, the club is bought. I mean, like, you would never buy a house without having a full assessment. You would never buy a car without doing a full assessment. And here you are, willing to spend tens of millions of pounds and sometimes just doing the most basic of assessments or there's pressure to try and get a medical done within a couple of hours. So I made it quite clear wherever club that I've been at is that, look, this is a long-term investment for you. I'm going to be impartial here. Uh, my medicals are going to take a minimum of seven to eight hours. This is what the process is going to be. I'm going to be as objective as possible. And then I'm going to explain to you all the risks. Then it's down to you to take that information and you can then make a decision. I never say yes or no. I give all the risk factors. This is what the problems are going to be in the short term. This is what the problems are going to be in the long term, depending on whether they're going to get a two, three, five year contract. And you've got to be aware of that. I then make sure that all those reports are then 
given to the chairman, the manager, the sporting director. I have the rest of the team involved as well, the physios, and we try and do as many testing as, as, as that we're able to do so that they can then make an informed decision. Because obviously, they made a decision from the, the footballing side. That's not for me to make a decision. Yeah. My thing is, listen, it's very well saying that uh, that player can you know perform well on the pitch, but can they stay on the pitch? And are they going to have any issues over the next three, five years? And, you know, uh, there have been times where a manager or a, a chairman have really insisted on a player. And it's become quite heated in terms of the arguments. And I just said to him, that's fine. I've given you my information. I'm not going to change my decision on that. There's the information. So you decide if you want to, if you want to buy that player. And what they want you to do is say, yes, buy that player. And I will never say buy that player because of the other, it's their money. I give them the risk factors, but they don't want to hear that. They said, well, should we sign them? If you're telling me that there's a good chance they're going to break down in the next two or three years, whatever, or, or that they're not going to play for the next two or three months, um, you know, they, they'll shift the responsibility. So I just put it back on them. I give them the information and then they can make an informed decision with clear, with clear facts as opposed to a subjective decision. And there's been plenty of times where um, I think our decision-making has been proven right, where we've had players who I've said, look, this is going to be an issue. They've gone and signed elsewhere for five years, whatever. And then they've broken down with the exact issue that I mentioned in my report. Uh, and they've then, you know, basically there's one player who, who literally over five years only played like 12 games. And, 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 you know, if you look at how much money was spent on that player, you, you're probably talking about near, you know, 20, 20 plus million pounds had been spent on that, on that player. Yeah, I've got then, a good guess on who that might be. Uh, I, I'm not going to say okay, that. I, actually, you, you, you probably don't, actually. You probably don't. You've probably not even heard of this player, uh, okay. to be honest. Yeah. Uh, so, but there have been a few players where I've said, don't uh, get that player. But then, then there's other times where uh, players have been bought against recommendation, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they make the decision and they can't turn around and say, well, you didn't tell us. Okay. When these teams take your advice and buy the players, they become assets and protection of assets is really important. In the COVID-19 pandemic that we're seeing in the world today, how good are the preparations from the clubs and how serious are they taking it? Obviously, they must be, but uh, are the players really protected? And a supplementary question to this, uh, does COVID-19 in a future of an athlete pose risk of cardiovascular compromise, respiratory compromise? So how are you guys dealing with that, especially as you a consultant and all things? Okay, sure. such? No, no problem. So um, I've been, again, I've been quite fortunate to have been heavily involved in, um, in setting up the protocols in, in the Premier League. Uh, with uh, with a small working group, so I'm the chairman for the Premier League Doctors Group as well. Uh, but also in uh, I've been I've been fortunate to have been part of the advisory working group to the government as well in terms of returning all sports. Um, so we've written a, a few papers on those uh, areas. I'll I'll send them to you uh, later actually for your own uh, information. Um, so the key thing was. At the end of the day, we need players to feel comfortable and safe uh, to return back to the training uh, ground. So we had to put protocols in place where the players were going to uh, have no issues regarding that. And so it was all very, it was, it was done in stages. Uh, so initially it was stage one. So there's five stages. So the stage one was uh, where the return to the training ground with social distancing Testing, uh, testing was put into place. So all the players are tested twice a week for COVID with PCR tests. They'll also get uh, a daily screen and a temperature check. Uh, so a daily screen of symptoms. And then even before that, it all started where we would make sure that I would have regular Zoom meetings with the players at least once a week while they were in quarantine or lockdown. And I would be updating them in terms of how they were. They were maintaining their fitness and, and we would, you know, they'd have their GPS, they would have their work sent out to them. So we knew that they were trying to maintain their work while they're at home. When they returned to the training ground, so we were quite lucky at, at uh, Crystal Palace. We've got Kent, uh, 
cricket ground right next to us, their second ground. So we used that and that allowed us to have much more space. And so we put various measures in place. So the players would turn up uh, in their uh, kit. Uh, they'd have a plastic box in which they would have their boots and water and anything else they need. They would be doing, uh, they wouldn't have any massages. They wouldn't have any showers there. They wouldn't have any food there. So again, we were trying to minimize risk as much as possible. And then slowly, once the players were comfortable with that, after about 10 days, then we started introducing uh, training where, uh, again, small numbers, but with social distancing reduced. And, and, and it was all very much in terms of a phased return. Um, and then the next stage was obviously uh, stage three, which is where we're at now, where we're able to return to games uh, behind closed doors. But again, very strict measures in place, making sure that players are observing as much as possible in terms of hygiene measures. Uh, you know, uh, they have their own water bottle, they have their own plastic boxes. And as much as possible off the pitch, they're keeping apart. We use GPS to make sure that players aren't close contacts uh, when they're on the pitch or limit their time as close contacts. So there's a stat which showed that uh, actually during a game, players are in close contact, i.e. within two metres of another player, uh, for only something like 40 seconds a wow. pair of players wow. during a 90-minute game. So the chance of them actually passing something on during a game of football and the fact that it's outside because of the UV light and the fact that the virus uh, will not stick down anywhere. It's inside where you're more likely to get the problems where it can land on surfaces and people in close environments. So there's various measures put in place, but at the same time, regular communication with players, making sure that they were satisfied that everything that is possible was done for them. Um, Alhamdulillah, so far at Crystal Palace, we've done something like over 650 tests. We've not had a positive test so far, but that yeah. really, but that really has come down to the players making sure that when they're away from the training ground, that they're behaving themselves, because that's where really it's it's, it's going to be picked up. Um, and then on the government advisory group, I was working with the chief medical officers from other sports, such as cricket, rugby, horse racing, and, and again. Uh, so football is one of the first sports to actually return here in the UK uh, alongside uh, uh, horse racing. So they've been learning from what we've done and what, what has worked and what hasn't worked. And then as a result, that fed back to the government. And then the government has slowly uh, also released statements in terms of for other sports and, and, and sports in general as well. So it's been quite exciting working on, on within that. Uh, so being, you know, really at the forefront with other specialists in terms of helping sport to return in this current environment. Uh, again, being in regular contact with other sports in other countries um, and, um, and also now being in, in, in a position where being able to give advice to, uh, to uh, other sports in other countries as well. Um, so such as the U S uh, Spain, uh, Germany, uh, Australia. So I got colleagues out there and, uh, uh, you know, just last week I was able to give a talk to various sports in, in such as Formula One, uh, rugby, uh, basketball and, and, and baseball out in the US. So it, it's been good. It's been good for learning process. And then regarding the risk in terms of uh, hampering performance, again, I, I'll send you another paper on that. So we, we've actually written a paper on guidance in terms of screening and cardiovascular issues. So again, one of my colleagues, Professor Sanjay Sharma, is one of the leading cardiologists in the world in terms of athletes. And so we've actually written a guidance paper on that uh, in terms of what we should be looking at if somebody has COVID and to make sure that they don't get something called myocarditis, in inflammation of the, uh, of the heart, which was something uh, that was found in, in patients who entered hospital. But you've got to remember that uh, those patients are a different uh, group set to the ones that we have. Uh, our athletes are obviously fitter, haven't got other comorbidities, uh, so they're much less likely to get and develop myocarditis, but we do actually look out for it. So anybody who does, or is unfortunately, if they were to pick up COVID-19, we would then screen them and it would be a phased return to sport and make sure that they weren't unlucky enough to, to get myocarditis. 
wonderful and, and everything you've put in place is going good we're loving the action in the premier league and loving crystal palace play so it's very heartening and hopefully uh, Pakistan Super League and Pakistan Cricket Board ends up uh, contacting UN Pakistan Football Federation, obviously as well, when they decide to restart uh, their sporting activities. Talking Pakistan, why is a Pakistani person more football than cricket, or is it? Uh, it is. Um, so to be honest, my, I, I've although I was born in Pakistan, I've lived in the UK since the age of two months. And the only time that I've uh, uh, been back to Pakistan was in 2005 and 2007. So I did uh, one week uh, uh, voluntary medical camp uh, following the earthquake in 2005. So in the Northwest. Um, so I went along there with another friend of mine. I had no real interest in terms of going back to Pakistan, even though I was born there. Just had not probably the best experiences living in Rochdale in, 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 in England and, and also because I've just not had the opportunity, my sister who's unwell and then going on to university. So I've not really had the opportunity. I enjoy cricket, but not, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not the biggest fan of, of, of cricket, um, but um, I enjoy playing at a university and, and when uh, I'm lecturing, we will always try and have a game against the students. I, my probably link with cricket was probably back in 2016, I got contacted by a coach uh, who had one of the Pakistani players who had an injury and, um, and asked if I'd be willing to see them. They had a groin issue and they'd been out for seven months. And I said, OK, well, if they come to the UK, I'll have a look at them. And it was quite surprising how basic the problem was. But um, I, and I, I can only go by what the player had said. The, the rehabilitation process that he'd gone through was probably not ideal. And I understand that they haven't got quite the setup and the finances that we have here. Um, so we, and the physios at, at, at Crystal Palace and stuff, we were able to help him get back to playing within uh, about four weeks. And then unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, but then one thing leads to another. Then another player had obviously heard about it. So I had another player who contacted me who'd been out for 18 months and uh, he then came over and again, you know, considering he'd been out for 18 months and it wasn't a big issue, <clears throat> the physios managed to help him get back and, and he was back playing again in, in, in six weeks. Um, listen, I'm not saying, we, I didn't do anything magic with them. It was just something that was quite relatively basic. Um, and so that's how my link with cricket, but... It's, it's an informal link. It's just the odd player. And also other people from Pakistan in other sports have contacted me and we've been able to ad advise them. Um, but football is my... I've always loved playing football. I enjoy cricket as well, but I think probably because of the fact that cricket is... I can say, you know, uh, it, it takes too much of your time. And so <laughs> I've, not, I've not been able to invest as much in cricket, although I enjoy it. And I've had to learn a little bit more about it so in terms of the, who the players are, because as I say, I've had a few cricketers who, who, who've come over over the last few years, which is not what I want either. Uh, I would much prefer that the cricketers and the squash players and the judo players and the football players over there in Pakistan, they should ideally have uh, the access to the best care possible um, because at the end of the day, these guys just want to play sports. And I think it's unfair if these guys are not on a level playing field, if they do pick up an injury, it shouldn't just be a case, OK, well, we'll put that person to the side and, and, and go for the next, you know, uh, next bowler or batsman or, or judo player or squash player. Really, these guys, it, it, it's their life, you know, and, and, and really we should be looking at trying to make sure that everything is in place to try and help these guys return to their sport as quickly as, as possible. So I think long term, one of the things that I'd love to do is try and advise, and I've done this all voluntarily and I have no issues in terms of trying to leave something behind, as my dad always says, is, is people need to remember for what you've, what you've done and what, what you've left behind. And so one of my dreams will be to try and help improve the, uh, the standards uh, in, of sports medicine in, in Pakistan, if it does indeed need improving. Um, and uh, well, that, that's one of my aims but let's see 
Well, the sports medicine scene in Pakistan definitely leads improvement and all the guidance we can get from you uh, will be cherished and really valuable as it has been in the past. So some questions on Pakistani football in general. So Pakistan in football scenes, we've not ever been like in one of the best nations football-wise in Asia and worldwide, languishing around 200, but that is partly because of some uh, political things that are happening here. But overall, when the game is on, uh, we tend to perform, well, how do you put it, not on par with the other Asian and international nations. Do you think fitness plays a part as, as you've been uh, seeing some Pakistani cricketers and football footballers as well uh, in the past. Do you think a lack of fitness thereof has participated in Pakistan being uh, far behind in football? Yeah, it, it's got to. It, you know, it has to for the simple reason that um, fitness also comes about people playing regularly. Okay. It's not just about what they're doing in the gym because that is important in terms of their strength, but you've got to be able to uh, play regularly. And you've got to have lots of people playing regularly uh, so that you can then choose those players that have got that natural skill who can then develop further. I've, I've had a little bit of background in terms of the politics there. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's not enough uh, football being played there. So if you look at other countries that are possibly even smaller, um, why, why, why does cricket uh, work so well in Pakistan? Simple reason is... It doesn't matter where you go, you will see players of people playing cricket. So that way, because you've got lots of people playing cricket, you've got a bigger chance of selecting those that have got that are likely to progress to the next level. So, um, and, and, and then what you need, what, what fitness and strength and, and conditioning provides, it provides consistency. And that's probably where you look at some of the sports in Pakistan where they've lacked. It's certainly that skill level is there. But where they've lacked is is having that fitness level to provide those consistent performances. Um, and you look at other countries now, so the likes of India, Australia, England, uh, in whichever sport that you're talking about, they play a huge emphasis on fitness. Uh, because at the end of the day, if a player is available, then they, they've got a chance of performing on the pitch. If they're not available, then they've got no chance. And a good example of that is, I go back to what Gus Hiddink did with South Korea. Uh, if you remember in, in one of the World Cups, I can't remember which one it was, he basically made the players organised, he made them fitter, he made them faster, he made them stronger. And in that short period of time, they were able to perform and they were able to compete. You know, you, Technically, they may not have been as, as good, say, as Brazil or, or the likes of the Dutch team, but he was at least he at least uh, enabled that team to be able to compete. And that's the same with regards to Pakistan football. I think we need fitter, faster, stronger players. You need that structure in there. You need a lot more players playing. Only then can you choose who the best players are and then maybe then take them to the next level. But without fitness... Uh, in any sport, you're always going to struggle. Before finishing the interview, uh, would you like to give some advice to Pakistani kids, Pakistani athletes on maintaining their fitness and basically on nutrition? Because traditionally, they see nutrition and the food we eat in Pakistan. Sometimes it's, it's uh, not regarded as the best you can have as an athlete. But your advice to athletes on nutrition and fitness in general? Yeah, look, there's a saying which says you are what you eat and you can't outrun a bad diet. So it doesn't matter uh, how much work you do, if what goes inside you is not right, then unfortunately, unless you burn that off, all that's going to end up happening is that's going to get stored uh, around the middle area and that's, you're just going to carry that as excess weight. And we know that Amongst Pakistani community, we've got big problems with type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And that is a large part of that is the diet. And we've really got to address that and even more so as athletes. Because look, the simple thing is, look at what Ronaldo, look at what the top players do. There's a reason why they are in the shape that they are. Not just because of what they do on the pitch, in terms terms of their training, but what they also do and how disciplined they are off the pitch. Okay. So we 
in terms of or a messy in terms of your skill set but certainly there's no reason why you can't be as strong as fit as them because that's in your control and that all comes down to how disciplined you are and how much work you're willing to put in so everyone knows with regards to those guys and, and what i found is the best players are also the hardest workers as well generally so you looked at steven gerard suarez you know henderson is another brilliant example regarding that these guys when they're on that training pitch you should see how hard these guys work the intensity is just ridiculous you know it's not about money for these guys it's just about right i just need to win this and 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 that that carries through then also when they're off the pitches as well how they conduct themselves because they know that for them to perform they've got to get everything right and again go back to we may not be able to make them the most skillful players that's that that that's for someone else but control the controllables sort your diet out make sure that you get into good practices make sure that you got good recovery strategies um that's not to say that you can that you you've got to be completely the opposite way and just have grilled foods all the time and and make sure that you know you don't have too much carbs yes you can have it in moderation but it's a balance but don't forget as i say all the food that goes in you really you should be looking at if you're serious about your sport then that should be the first thing and that should be in your control and really that should be the easiest thing uh that you should be able to uh, uh, to be able to manage now head of the sports medicine department at crystal palace worked at liverpool premier league winning side champions league winning side worked at tottenham what does the future hold for dr zafar iqbal um I, look I just want to continue working in sport and football uh, for as long as I can uh and my main thing is inshallah to support my uh family uh, as best as I can um and you know and that's it really so I I don't I I'm really grateful from day to day especially in this current covid environment how you see uh you know I, i'm really blessed to be in 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 the work environment that i am that i can go back to work you know i can put food on the table i've got a roof over my head and i've got you know as far as i'm concerned the best job in the world i have i'm not i'm not even people that might see this is a strange thing to say i haven't got any long term plans i'm not somebody who is really motivated in terms of the fact that right i've got an ambition to be a doctor at 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 such a such a club even when i first started out i never had the intention of working in football it was just right i'm now a sports doctor i want to try and provide the best services i can so even now whatever whatever work that i do it's a case of i need to try and provide the best that i can at this moment in time and so so even for example why why have i got involved with the guys of the covid groups why have i got involved in terms of trying to help write papers my main thing is, is is trying to find whatever best practice is and trying to be the best at that uh where that takes me i have no idea alhamdulillah that's allah's will i don't you know i'm i'm not got any, i honestly no word of a lie i've not got any goals in terms of i want to be at x y and z club if i'm at crystal palace for the next uh, 20 years inshallah in the premier league i'll be honestly i'll be overjoyed with the guys that you know my main thing is my family is still with me and and uh, that that's my priority well sir thank you so much for your time you've made time for us from your busy schedule we wish you the best for your future and we hope you keep on breaking barriers inspiring other people and doing exciting new things for uh, clubs football athletes in general and our community a pleasure to have you with us so thank you so much and okay, so what thank you thank you sir Perfect.